While interviewing a photographer for another project, someone posed a question. They asked how it's possible to create unique images when virtually everything has already been photographed before. If you only see photography as a means of documenting something, simply capturing what it looks like, that question might make sense. Thankfully, there's more to photography than that. Great photography, even of the most familiar and frequently photographed subject matter, can be a revelation when created with a distinct point of view. Such images not only look different, but they evoke a different feeling, which is both unexpected and gratifying. Melissa O'Shaughnessy's images of New York, featured in her new book, Perfect Strangers, make a case for just such an argument. One of the most photographed destinations in the world, New York is a city that has been interpreted in an endless variety of ways. For a city that is so often defined by its legends and its myth, it is revealed with a surprising sense of intimacy through Melissa's lens. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Well, congratulations on the book. Thank you. It's exciting. I know. The first book is uh, it's just like a baby. It is. <laughs> you know, it is like a baby. Getting it out there and you finally get to hold it after all that time you dedicated to it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it really feels good. It really feels good. We, you know, because we had to do all the production in during the pandemic. So that was a little tricky mm -hmm. getting prints and color conversions done kind of with prints bring, being dropped in the trunk of a car, like a spy novel, but we got it done. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really interesting because I've known of your work for a very long time, even before we met down in, I think Miami, mm -hmm. at the Miami HD photography festival. And it's interesting to to see one's pictures like online on their website or on Instagram. And then it's quite different when you actually sort of hold the book and it's been curated, you know, yeah. to a degree in a way that doesn't happen when you're just looking at stuff online. Even if it's on a on a website, there's something very different about seeing it in the book. And I know that it can be tough going to to make the choices in terms of what goes in and what doesn't. But, you know, when you look at the work that's in the book, what do you consider, if there is one, sort of the underlying theme that makes the entirety of this book sort of provide the sort of the connective tissue? Well, I think the title sums it up very well, Perfect Strangers. It is a, I think, a very humanistic look at the people uh, and the energy of New York City. Uh, so that's very much what we tried to communicate through the through the sequence and through the selection of photographs that we chose from my work, it's really about the people and the energy of New York and how they collide and the, the variety of beauty and character and interaction on the streets of the city, might I say pre-COVID, because it feels yeah. very... Uh, COVID kind of yanked it into the past in a way that I simply couldn't have anticipated because we're all kind of operating in, with our, through our work in the flow of time. Um, and it takes a long time to, to give street photography a patina of age, right? Yeah. And, and I think people become more interested in street photography, broadly speaking, when it does have that kind of historical feel or patina of age or a sense of another time and how people used to dress and interact on the street. And suddenly this work that is really quite current, it's all done in the past six or seven years, feels a little bit of another time because of the way the streets are looking now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I was looking at work that was done like in the 80s uh, in New York. And it has that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's basically been like a, a glass of wine. You know, it's been allowed to age, and and you take a look at it, and it's not remarkably remarkably much different in terms of the photographic approach, in terms of how the streets and the people were photographed. But given time, all of a sudden, it adds a whole new context to to what you're seeing. Absolutely, but like you said, but you know, with COVID, especially for the people who have experienced New York since COVID hit, where they're seeing the sort of the empty streets. It's an even more significant contrast to see your work and, and what New York has been for the last six, seven, or eight months. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really shocking. And I've been going back in a couple of days a week to try to make something of it. But, you know, I, I had my cow path. I had my places that I went that I, at times that I could be reasonably sure there would be, you know, chaos and crowds and interactions. And you go, you know, Midtown classically is, is, you know, on a Friday afternoon just used to be chaos, wonder, mm-hmm. beautiful chaos. Um, and it's empty, you know, without the without commuters and business people and tourists, you realize how much the street life relied upon the number of people coming in and out of the city every day. So downtown is a little more lively. Um, I live near Union Square and and Chinatown and and that area is really feels like it's coming back to life. but but midtown, the upper east, you know, it, Midtown, kind of on Fifth Avenue, which was a big haunt for a lot of street photographers, is utterly, utterly changed. Yeah. And it's, it's on the one, you know, it's really heartbreaking for people who love the city. But I think a lot of people feel, you know, the city will be back. Oh, yeah, it certainly it's, will. Yeah. It, it, it will come back, but it, it, it doesn't, it, it's going to be a while. But it must have been an interesting challenge for you to photograph it under those kinds of conditions because you couldn't rely on your old sort of tropes, right? Absolutely. Things that you were that you were used to doing when you encountered you encountered the streets that were just busy and, and thick with people. So talk to me about that. Well, it's just utterly changed and I felt very very safe in crowds in New York City. I I I kind of use them as as protection as a shield as a as a way to be invisible in a crowd i'm small Mm -hmm. i'm you know middle-aged i'm a woman so i was able in a really crowded new york street was able to kind of disappear and and i felt safe doing that with fewer people you're much you know with a camera and you're taking pictures of people you're much more exposed um so that's been a big adjustment i'm really there's it's it's i'm I mean, all the street photographers I know who kind of work in the way that I do are finding it a huge challenge. You know, I love people. I love their faces, their expressions, their emotions. And when they're behind a mask, as well they should be right now, yeah. it's it's a different thing. It becomes about just purely about the pandemic because everybody is masked. And so the work you do now in the streets is going to to be of this time and you know, hopefully we won't all be masked for years to come. But the work, the work that's being done now is going to to reflect what we're going through. Do you see that you're making different kinds of images as a result of a result of that change? Images that you likely wouldn't have made before, not, uh, not just in terms of subject matter, but just in terms of how you've had to adapt and and change the way that you see and you shoot. Absolutely. I mean, it's about, I'm looking at architecture more, you're looking at windows and reflections and empty storefronts, the whole, the background that that you rely upon is suddenly pushed into the foreground, because there's so few people in it. So it's, it's, you look around, and you're naturally suddenly kind of more interested in architecture and signage and, and the space that is New York which was a, a lovely backdrop, but not the subject of my work in the past. So mm-hmm. absolutely. So it's, it's, it's not easy, but I'm getting in and seeing, seeing what of it. And it'll be interesting how, when the city does return to normalcy, how that experience will have changed how you shoot and how much yeah. different your pictures will be yeah. as a result yeah. of having this sort of dearth of subject matter and really looking at the city itself as a subject and as a character. I mean, do you find this true out in L.A. as well? Are you? Well, for me in L.A., I have not been going out. I have two people who are at, are at risk. Mm-hmm. So I've sort of limited my my street photography work uh, since COVID started. Right. But from what I've seen and from what I've talked to with friends, it's similar to New York. But Los Angeles has never been a, a dense place. Right. You know, there's certain locations like you could go to Venice at one point downtown, but a lot less so. Maybe Hollywood, but th- there wasn't an, an air, uh, a, a really a good portion of Los Angeles where you could like weave yourself through the crowd and basically go hunting. Right. You know, I know it's an aggressive term to, to use, but that's exactly what you can do in New York. Right. You know, you can target 
you know, uh, interesting subject and move yourself through. And like you said, uh, be afforded a sense of invisibility. And it yeah. allows you to get incredibly close to a subject matter, make the photograph, and then just, you know, continue to be carried by the sea of humanity that's around you. And I know that that's what you do. I mean, I look at your photographs. One of the, the things that I love about your photographs is how immediate and intimate that they are. Yeah. And I'm, I'm uh, that, that doesn't, that doesn't come easy. No, it took me, it took me, it took me longer, I think, than most to, to, to be comfortable working so close to people. But it's, it's like a muscle. You just, sometimes I go out and I just, I, I just start clicking the shutter. The first pictures are never any good. But if you don't start responding and pushing the shutter of the camera and pointing your camera at things, then nothing, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like warming up and getting into shape. So, so yeah, it took me, I think longer than many to, to get so close and to know that I could be close to people and not get in trouble and not usually not be seen. I'm very quick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but then you get to a point where you've made enough good pictures that you realize you want the picture more than you fear the consequences. So I'm definitely, definitely there. Yeah. And, you know, the truth is, in, in New York anyway, it's such a busy place. Uh, everyone's taking pictures of everyone and everything all the time. I mean, it's just a camera going up to someone's eyes usually doesn't attract any notice in a, in a busy spot. I mean, certainly, yeah. you know, if it's a soul, if it's a soul figure, you're, you're in a different situation. But, yeah. Yeah, because the biggest obstacle at, at that point just becomes you. It's not oh. so much what the person has done because you haven't made the photograph yet. It's just right. this an anticipatory anxiety that prevents oh, yeah. you from using the camera and, and pressing the shutter release button. Yeah. So now, you know, it's I certainly feel more exposed in the way the streets are now. But it's life is coming back. Who knows? I mean, we're probably gonna have to lock down to some degree again this this winter. It's really starting to look like that. But we'll see. We'll see. I have hope for the. I have hope for the city and a great, a great love for the city. And I hope that's the other. That's the other thread that comes through the book is is my real deep affection for the people of the city and the energy of the city. So it's perfect strangers, but it's also a, a love letter of of mine to New York. I'm not a native New Yorker, but um, maybe someday, you know, I, I'm honored to be a New Yorker at this point. Yeah. When did you uh, arrive in New York? To live. Um, we move. I'm from. I'm from Minneapolis. I'm in the Midwest originally, uh, where we moved to the East Coast in 1991, um, in the suburbs of New York City. And then, when our children were older and two of them were living in the city, we bought an apartment uh, in Union Square just to be closer to our kids as a family. Um, so I'm not there. Uh, you know, seven days a week. I'm there through two, three, four days a week. And that was in 2011. So I really started working on the streets with any capacity. I had a uh, hope, but no real ability. Around 2000, 2014 was okay. when I started to really, really be working in the manner that is reflected in the book. And, and, and why, why the streets? Why did you gravitate to that? There's so much different subject matter that's out there. It's always interesting to kind of have a sense of why people are drawn to what, what was likely one of the more difficult genres of photography to practice oh i think so it's 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 a very frustrating undertaking <laughs> I, think, I, I you know because you know as everyone said it's just fraught with failure if you're not comfortable with failure and, and being out for a long day and coming up with nothing you know it's not going to be for you because uh the good ones are few and far between i think i think as i you know, developed as a photographer, I realized the pictures that I was most interested in looking at were of people and interactions and, and the human condition. Um, mm -hmm. So even though I started out in my 40s when I stopped working and my son wanted to build a dark room, I learned black and white film photography and was t working in the suburban landscape and and all sorts of work that will never see the light of day. And I fell in love with the craft, but it was the combination of realizing the work that I was interested, that I respected and was interested in looking at mm -hmm. was street photography and, and people and 
photojournalism. And that was really what turned me on. So that's, that's what headed me in that direction. And it was, uh, I took a workshop with Joel Meyerowitz around the time we bought the apartment, maybe a few years afterwards. And I'll never forget in the workshop, he was talking about photography as a medium and its unique capacities. And he, that he felt that street photography was probably the f- purest expression of the photographic medium. I mean, that painters had been painting portraits and sculptors had been sculpting people and painters had been doing landscapes and that all these different artistic mediums had approached a lot of the genres that photography also approaches. But no medium has ever ever had that capacity to to slice off a five hundredth of a second and present it as, you know, here is here is the world. Mm-hmm. And that's there seems something really pure and enticing about that idea. That street photography is really something that only photography can do, that only the camera can do. And I think you I think people who get <laughs> dare I say, obsessed with with doing the work and being out on the streets and catching those moments. I think it's the first photograph, too, that you take, that when you, you take the photo, you've responded to something, but then you go back and whether it's film or, or digital, you go back and you look at the photograph and you see things in the photograph that you didn't see when you took them, you know, that you can't absorb everything at once. And so there will be a detail here or there an ex- or ex- an expression or a person or a way that you framed something that you didn't know until you looked at the photograph at least consciously correct oh yeah Yeah. i mean that's the way we could go down that rabbit hole um, (laughs) you know about what what subconsciously we're drawn to consciously and subconsciously and how they those things gradually reveal themselves in the work and i think I think I learned that in the process of making this book. I learned a lot of things that I wouldn't have been able to to express before about how I see, what I respond to, mm-hmm. um, what works for me, what what then became the body, what then went into this book to tell a story about the city and about how I see the city. And on that point, I think that you know those those elements that you're not completely conscious of when you make the photograph, but that that aid the photograph in being effective, you know, mm. seeing it at once or twice, luck. You start seeing it consistently in your work and you realize that there's something there, that it's Absolutely. not just chance, that there's something happening and that we're completely, you know, unable to really sort of grasp or describe, but that it's there because you can see it in the photograph. And right. at least for me, that that encourages me to sort of trust that instinct and not be so quick to allow the critic to interrupt the flow of just creating the photographs, which is something, you know, is the constant struggle, I think, of any street photographer is to resist the temptation to, you know, start editing themselves while they're in the middle of the street. Yeah. And I love that you said that because something that I have learned is to trust my instincts. You know, really to trust them because if I overthink it, it's 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 lost. Um, I have an instinctual. You know, there's there's things that we're all through our own life experiences and age and interests. There are things that are going to bubble up in the work if you keep at it and and keep editing and keep piling up the work. And then you know you start going through. You know, when we were going through the editing process, I mean, we started with three hundred pictures, right? And mm. you start sifting and sifting, you know, for the title, for the edit, for the for this through line, for the connections. You start sifting and sifting through that work, and then things, you know, lovely things start to bubble to the top and and tell you about what you've been doing all these all these years yeah. on the hot in the hot pavement or the cold streets. So yeah. When you were going through the editing process, what kind of feelings came up for you? in terms of how you saw yourself as the photographer? Not that I made these pictures, but as a, a sort of an objective observer, what, what kind of feelings came up for you? Wow, that's, that's interesting and difficult. I guess the work started to reveal a point of view that I wasn't as aware of before I started the process. There's a lot of tenderness in the approach to people. I mean, I... Yeah. I 
I think it's it's kind and generous. Um, there was a picture or two that we kind of took out because it felt maybe a little mean. It was funny, but mm-hmm. maybe a little mean. And then that suddenly didn't fit the work. Um, I'm not intentionally mean, but some, you know, it's like, well, you know, does that fit this story I'm telling? So I guess a, a, a lovely kind of, um, I started to see my affection for the people more clearly than maybe I went out with that particular intent. It started, you know, how much that I liked people and responded to the way we behave and look and present ourselves suddenly kind of started to show a real affection and delight in people. I mean, this happens to be New York. This is what gave the structure to the work. This is where I live and work. You know, so that's all very natural. And New York has been very photographed. But, you know, it is the mm-hmm. mecca and, and, and one of the great meccas of street photography. So, you know, to make something different of it um, with a unique voice was top of mind. But then it did start to reveal itself. You know, because I'm a woman and small and middle-aged, I can approach families and children without being a threat. And I think because I have a family and, and children that I'm naturally drawn to some of those interactions, you know, a mother scolding a child or a mother clutching, you know, the hands of her child as she crosses the street. And suddenly those things I relate to very viscerally because I've been through them. And I'm also in a position, you know, in just my physical presence to take those photographs, whereas a lot of men would, don't anymore. They don't feel that it's um, worth pissing people off. People are very mm-hmm. sensitive about, about having their children photographed. And, and certainly the photographs in this book are in no way invading a child's, you know, dignity or, or space or anything, but they're presenting, here's family life out on the street. Here's the mother yeah. clutching the hands. Here's the mother scolding the child. Here's, you know, here's how we dress our children alike. It, it, it you know, here, here's the harried mother. I mean, it's all there. Um, and I think I'm able to put that in the work with, with real respect towards that aspect of life on the street. And you don't see it as much. I yeah, think that- that's one of the things that I like about the, the photographs, especially in contrast with other ph- photographers who have shot in New York in as close proximity to the subject as you have, right? That gentleness comes across uh, as opposed to other photographers where it seems that it's much more aggressive, more oh, invasive. It's really nice. I, I, I take that as the highest compliment. Thank you. But it really demonstrates how it's not proximity alone that creates the effect of the photograph. It's really about the, in, about the intent and the vision of the photographer. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, you could have a 35 by 20 millimeter lens be in New York and get really close to your subjects. And that doesn't mean that all the photographs are going to be the same. The choice of the subject, right. how you choose to approach them, your own sort of mind space creates a huge impact on the resulting photographs. Yeah. And I think and that's I- really, and that's really interesting when I look at your photographs because I I pine for uh, being able to get that sort of intimate image. I find it easier in New York to do what you're doing in terms of getting in that proximity because as we described earlier, you know I can hide amidst the crowd. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's more sparse in in Los Angeles. So uh, my intentionality has to be hidden in terms of is when I raise the camera and how yeah. at what point when I get into proximity of the subject, do I raise the camera and make the image? I can't be like, you know, you can't, you can't be working around the scene. moving the crowd and suddenly come up and then I'm gone. Yeah. And that's something that a crowded city certainly gives you that a more sprawling metropolis like L.A. does not. But that you probably have a whole set of skills that I don't have, and that is kind of sizing up the scene, framing it in your head, yeah. you know, placing people where you think it might work, and then if you're lucky, you get two, two cracks at it. You know, in New, right, York, in New York, you can stand at, at 5th and 42nd for a half an hour and just be a part of the tide and, and 
and, and attract very little attention. I mean, some people notice, but, you know, people are, you know, in the past anyway, we're in too much of a rush. Um, now the city is slowed, you know, people are moving slower. There isn't the, the, the rush to Grand Central that there used to be at five o'clock on a Friday. So yeah. the whole, there's a little more time to think through the picture. I don't know that I'm very good at it yet, but this is, this is what is, this is what we've got to work with. So. You use the term the the cow path, which is like the usual trail path that you go back and forth to make yeah. your make your images. Some people are reluctant to go to places they've been before because they feel like, well, I've made photographs there before. Why would I want to go back? Why is that familiar territory so important to you? Well, it's some of the ba- to start with the basics. You know where the light is going to be at any given hour of the day. You know where the crowds are going to be. I've gotten to know very much kind of the pulse of New York. I usually start my day, I'll run down to Chinatown for a couple hours because Chinatown is all, the street life in Chinatown is is just, you know, daughters are out with their elderly mothers and people are shopping and men are stocking the butcher shops. and, And there's always, you know, people do all their shopping and marketing right out in the in the streets. So even, you know, I wasn't in New York City during the the peak of the lockdown. Um, Like you, I have an elderly mother and and have to be very careful uh, about exposing myself. But so I would kind of dip into Chinatown. Sometimes I head all the way down to Wall Street, kind of lunch hour in the summertime. I wouldn't go down there much in the winter because the buildings are so tall and, and the light, the sun is so low that there's no light, that it's just kind of dark feels kind of dark all day. And then, you know, then after lunch, I head uptown with the sun at my back. And I know I can kind of wend my way to the west side for a little bit, maybe run through Times Square and then up Fifth Avenue in the summer, the days are longer and into Central Park. So, but then you do find yourself feeling, oh my, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm on a cow path. Mm-hmm. You know, that am I doing this? Am I making the same sort of image? Am I, are they starting to look alike? I mean, I've run into friends in New York. Again, this is all pre-COVID, where we kind of look at each other and say, are you, t- it sounds really spoiled, but are you getting a little tired of New York? That, you know, if you're kind of working in the same places all the time, it starts to feel overly familiar. But I think yeah. that's true of anyone anywhere. I mean, we all crave the trip to another city because it just kind of, it's like a little electric jolt to the system that you're seeing new things and looking for new things and finding people who look a little different or street corners that feel have their own kind of vibe. It's already November and I can hardly believe it. So many of these months have been a blur with me sometimes feeling that I'm just stumbling awkwardly through the days. I know that I'm not alone in that in that feeling. However, one of the things that has helped me keep a healthy perspective have been these conversations. Every time I boot up the computer, move the mic into place, and hit the record button, I know that at least for the next hour, I'm going to have a great conversation. Each time one ends, it leaves me feeling that I've done something positive, not only for myself, but for so many others. Each time I receive a message from one of you, that idea is affirmed and encourages me to put in the work necessary to make another episode possible. It's that appreciation that we carry with us as we near the transition between our 13th and our 14th year of production. Regardless of how long you've been listening to the show, you play a big role in our success. And when you choose to support us financially, you increase our ability to deliver you the best show that we can. If you haven't already, today is a great day to start by becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do that by contributing $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Even $5 a month makes a difference. Only a couple of hundred people do this, and that may surprise you. And if it does, you can help change that by becoming a Patreon supporter today. Thank you, as always, for your support. So when you travel to, say, Miami or some city in Europe or to the West Coast, how do those different circumstances, that different subject matter, um, 
what do you, what do you enjoy about that? I mean, you just mentioned the fact that it's it's newness has an effect, but how does the fact that it's so different from what you're used to um, help or hinder you? Well, I think, as I said, that the help is that it's all visually new. I mean, photographers were such visual people and, and, and craving, you know, a, a new place all the time. But I think it's, it's that jolt, like, like, here's a whole new thing that I've not tried before that sets you off exploring. I never make, I, I, I always feel like I wish I had more time in a place, kind of by the time I've figured out, you know, where the light is right and where the energy feels right, it's time to go. I mean, it took me, it took me six years to put this book together of work in New York. So I'm always, I always come back from a trip a little frustrated by, well, I really didn't come up with much and it's never going to amount to much. I might have a couple of good interesting pictures, but how do I build it into understanding a place and its people in more depth? Mm -hmm. I mean, those are the challenges of, of travel. I think a lot of people feel that way, that they would want more time than a, a week long vacation or trip would afford them to, to make interesting work. But, you know, street photography is also born, you know, it starts with that single image, right? And, you know, you can go to Miami and come, come up with a couple really great pictures. But then what do you do with them? I mean, you've, you've made them, you've had the, the quickness and the responsiveness and the vision to, to make a go few good pictures in a new place. Well, then what, what does that mean? Where, what are you going to use them for? What is, are, are you going to build them into a body of work? And, and I run up against that every time I travel. You know, that getting to know a place seems really important to me to build a body of work. Ha to having enough time. It's really time. Street photography is boots on the ground, man. It's the mm. uh, it's time because it's so fraught with failure because the good ones are so few and far between. It's just it's really it's 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 time on the pavement, hours on the pavement that's going to yield that's going to yield a project or a book. But I love it, so it never never feels like work. One of the things that may surprise you that I'll say is that. For your work, I see your height as an advantage because I look at the photographs, and the the eye the eye line is below mine, and for me to create that kind of image, I physically have to bring the camera down or crouch down in order to do it, right? right. But that is your perspective, and it creates an, a, a significant perspective in the photograph. And I know, like Gus Powell is like I think he's six two or six three. He's six really, five. really tall. I just I six just five. did an event with him the other night. It's 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 amazing uh, the difference yeah. in our in our worldview, you know, height wise. It, but exactly right, the average height photographer. That's you know, the, you can see that reflected in the great majority of the photographs because so many people are photographing at their eye level. So there can be a real sameness into that perspective. But get somebody who's very tall or someone who's shorter than normal. And suddenly, the pictures take on a completely different feel just because of a few inches. Right. No, it's 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 interesting. I when I started out, I thought my height was and my gender, quite frankly, were huge disadvantages. You know that I didn't have testosterone. I didn't have any aggression. I'm this little woman. Um, how can I possibly do this? I felt I felt it was really I felt at a disadvantage. I can't see what's coming, you know, in a crowd. Mm -hmm. I cannot see over the heads of people to know what's coming. So I have to work in the way where I'm close and just very quick and reacting to what's, you know, eight, six, eight feet in front of me. And I've had several men tell me that they I would never have seen my height in relation to my work as being anything to remark upon. And, and since this book has come out, three or four people have said to yeah. me, I can see your height is such an advantage because it gives the work a, a, an intimacy, you know, that I'm pointing, you know, I'm more at, you know, kind of mid chest level. I hit people, you know, is where I hit people. I'm five, three. I mean, I'm not that short. I'm not, you know, teeny, teeny. But short enough to give the pictures um, an eye level that's very different, maybe than what what a lot of street photographers. You know, most men. What are they? You know, five, ten, six feet. You know, that's you oh, know, yeah. that's, a, that's a full head difference than me. So it's going to give it a different feel. But it's interesting. Before 
you know, I haven't heard that said about my work until now, until people have kind of looked through the book and, and, and felt it, you know, looking at a book is such a, you know, instead of a one inch picture, you do get an experience of, of the scale of things to, to yeah, because I was it. sitting in my, sitting in my chair and just sort of taking it in slowly, take, looking at the pictures, soaking every inch of it in it's something you don't know when you're looking at a picture on your phone, you know, mm-hmm. you're doing the swipe constantly, you know, I like it, like it, you know, yeah. but when you're sitting there with a the book, you get to linger and absorb it and really kind of soak it in. And, something you rarely will do on your phone, you'll return to those images. You'll, yeah. you'll pick up that book more than once and take a look at it and try to learn from it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it, it was a thrill to get the, the first bound copy in the mailbox um, of my own book. So uh, I think it's, you know, I, I worry about Instagram being the way that the vast majority of photography is consumed, you know, because if you put up a kind of a, a complex picture with a lot going on or something that's a little harder to absorb. It's like, meh, mm. you know, the Instagram rewards the strong shadow and the bright color and the simple composition. And, you know, what is that, what is that doing to what we think is a food, good photograph? I think, you know, not good things at this, you know, I hate to be completely down on it because it is an incredible source of, of um, inspiration and exposure. People can put their work out there and, you know, gain attention in a way that the past never afforded us, even when it was just, you know, the, the internet and websites. So, but it comes with its pitfalls. And I think we all have to be really, really cognizant about that when we put up a picture and we like it and we think it's interesting and there's something going on, but it doesn't give it people the jolt of the, you know, half a second they're given half a second of attention that you get on a picture on that little screen. So putting it together in in a book, as you know, is really um, a really wonderful opportunity. Yeah. One of the things that I also appreciate is is your depthness in really making the most out of the frame. Uh, I tend to be more of a fisherman, you know, okay. where I'll, I'll kind of, ex- I'll find a setting, I'll find a scene, I'll slowly piece it together and wait for a telling element to come in mm-hmm. or a gesture like like that. But you're sort of like diving in and, and, and getting your shots. But what's fascinating about it is even though that you're doing that, I'm not seeing things at the periphery of the frame that are proving to be distractions. It seems yeah. that even when you're in a sea of people and you have a center per, a person who is sort of the focal point of the image, there are other people that sort of exist in the frame, but that are still sort of complementing or contrasting the main subject. It's not like, oh, I wish that person wasn't there because it ruins the image. To what degree do you think you're, you're aware of that as you're moving in to make your, your photograph and you make the choice to release the shutter? Well, I think you've just, again, instincts and you hone that skill over time. Believe me, uh, there are a lot of pictures on the cutting room floor where, you know, my en- <laughs> you know, friends know my enemy is that electric, like green, yellow green that construction people wear or people wear yeah, neon uh-huh. t-shirts. I can't tell you how much I hate people who wear neon clothing because it is ruined <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm like, we, I guess maybe it's time to turn to black and white, but it has ruined more photographs than than you can imagine. I mean, I think it's it's a combination of things. Obviously, I'm not showing the work where there's something, there's not pictures in the book that I'm not happy with. And there's a lot of those where there may be something really interesting going on, but was ruined by something on the periphery that that pulled your eye to the wrong place. But as far as how I, you know, how I frame and select, it's become really, it's become very instinctive. Um, and again, I think it's that just time on the streets, the time you put in, you get, you, you, your, your sixth sense becomes honed enough on a good day, you know, to know. And hey, listen, if there's something awful at the very edge of the frame, I crop it out. I'm not a purist about, about that. I mean, you mm-hmm. can't save a bad picture with a heavy crop, but there might be a little something, you know, on one edge or another that can come out and, and enhance the photograph. So I'm, I'm no stranger to that, certainly. Um, but no, I want my pictures f- full of life. I, uh, you know, there are pictures in the book where there's a central figure in the center, but their supporting cast is very important to make it an yeah. interesting picture. Um, you, you can put someone front and center, 
But if there's nothing around it and that's all you ever do, you're not going to tell a story about New York. You're going to be making street portraits. And hey, that's a, that's a wonderful thing to do. And a lot of people do it beautifully. But I'm trying to be tell a bigger picture of what's going on all around maybe this interesting person in the center or, you know, the energy that the collision of, of a group of people, uh, suddenly it tells five different stories, but they're all in my frame and I get to tell a bigger story because those individuals relate in some way because I've put them together in a picture. You've been associated with the uh, Women Street Photographers and the group of women, uh, some of whom are in New York. Um, yes, there's well, there's two. There's two. Um, Gulnara Samaloyeva, who I think yeah. you've had her on the podcast, right? Started right. a group mm-hmm. called Women Street Photographers. She's in New York, but it's really an international group of, of women. I mean, there's naturally, because we're physically in New York, there's some of us who get together. Um, and then Casey Meshbesher in the Twin Cities, where I hearken from, uh, started a group on Facebook called Women in Street. So about three or four years ago, um, these two women kind of together and independently of each other realized that women were not getting, maybe getting their due in the world of street photography, that there were a lot of women doing it, but not really being recognized or given a platform or putting themselves into competitions or putting themselves into festivals uh, in the same way that, that their, you know, their male car- counterparts have. And that's no fault of the men. It's, it's, it's uh, these two um, groups, I think, gave women a place to go that's saying, oh, you're doing this too? I didn't know there were, you know, there were other women doing it. So all of a sudden there are women coming out of the woodwork and you're seeing really amazing work being done and shown by women. I mean, uh, Gulnara puts on, a number of exhibitions every year, COVID or no COVID, she's a force of nature. Oh, yeah. And uh, she's got a great venue. She lives at a PS 109 in New York that has gallery space. And, you know, she can avail herself of it, you know, a certain number of weeks per year. So she puts on these incredible uh, exhibitions of all women. And it's incredible work. The shows are amazing. She's got one up in Trieste now, I think. She's had a show recently in Russia. Um, she really has poured herself into it. And, and it's really lovely to see the women given a platform uh, and a place where their work is, is, is featured. So it's great. What, what kind of dialogues do you think that those communities have afforded you that might not have been possible in like a traditional group of uh, guy photographers who, who practice street? Well, I don't think that they, they, this is a hard question for me to answer, because certainly you get a camaraderie and a safe place amongst women who are kind of doing the same thing. So you can talk about the issues of being a woman doing this. Maybe you're a mother with smaller children, and how do you find the time? And so you're, you're, you know, you're in a group of like-minded people with people with and with women maybe facing some of the same challenges as you. Certainly, I have made so many friends on the streets who are men who have the same passion that I do and the same interest. And there, it, it isn't, it's not really about gender. I, I mm-hmm. like to think, but I think women needed a, a platform to, to kind of enter the fray in a, in a, you know, with, with encouragement, maybe, you know, it has been male dominated. I don't think it's going to stay that way very long. However, you know, I think women do amazing work with, with maybe some of the, sensitivity that comes from being a mother or a caregiver or whatever. I mean, I don't want to, again, just put it in those gender terms, but we bring a different, sometimes a little different worldview to the pictures. And I think I, I tried to make that clear in my book, you know, that it's, it's, there is, you'll see it. But I think it's, you know, they're not easy pictures to make. They're not soft pictures. But maybe, maybe my height gives them a sense of a gentle nature. I don't know. No, but I think these, these groups have been great for women, and they're really encouraging communities, which we all need, no matter what the community is. And I think it's interesting that this work didn't come as a result of you going out and shooting every day, that you know, you 
you'd get out when you could, and usually maybe on the weekends or something like that. Mm -hmm. So talk about, you know, you, you still had other things to do with your life, but, you know, make, talk about making the time to go out and, and do it because we always have an excuse as to why we shouldn't go out and shooting today. Right. Right. No, I think, I think people who do this understand. I mean, if you've got a, a, that's why I'm mostly on the weekends because of other commitments. Um, and that's when I'm in the city. Uh, I make time when, when life affords it. And, you know, you have to be making this kind of work. You have to find a little time to be selfish for your own work and take that time. And it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's when you grow to love it, being out and, and being so responsive to the world and so, open to chance is really a lovely way to live, you know, and hopefully that spills over into other aspects of, of your life, you know, that you're just, you're, you're kind of able to live in the now and observe things as they are and be present. It, it, the, the, it requires great presence. So I don't think, I don't know a lot of street photographers who can be out there doing that seven days a week. Oh my God, it'd be exhausting. <laughs> I'd be exhausted. Um, because it is, it can be a long day. It can be tiring. It's a lot of walking. Um, and if you're just doing the same thing day after day, it's maybe a little hard to stay fresh and come with a new idea now and again. Um, so that's, so that helps, I think, having a few days and, and off. And not having anything. legs that feel perpetually sore. Yeah, yeah. But there are people who are out all the time. Um, it de depends on the demands, of, as you well know. Mm -hmm the demands of life uh, can encroach pretty rap rapidly. So I got pretty good at peeling off my two days a week and saying, this is mine. You know, so I go out in all, all weather. I can't, it's, it's not just fair weather friend. It's, it's um, go out when you have the day and, and, and bundle off if you need be and bring a bottle of water if it's hot and, and uh, make it work. So. Well, my last question is that I, that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that photographer be and why? Well, you're going to kill me because I've got five. I couldn't pick <laughs> one. But then you can, you can find them all that, in that, one. You, I, I, officially, I officially deem you a New Yorker now. Okay. But you I, don't I, ask permission. You just tell me what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's, that's what comes from working in the street and, and, and being so bold. No, I'm going to, I'm going to name the, I'm, I'm in a, a group called the, the up photographers collective, and I am going to point uh, my finger at the five other women uh, in the group whose work you can all find at up photographers and their individual websites. If you care to go further, the, the five women, uh, the six, there are six of us in the collective and the five other women other than myself are Graciela Magnoni, Allison McCauley, Julia Beyer, Eleanor Simon, and Meg Hewitt. And their work is astonishing. Each one of them has a very singular vision and voice. And um, I, I'm so proud to call them friends and colleagues because their work is just really extraordinary. So those are five women that deserve a, a look, but I, I get off the hook, I guess, because I'm a New Yorker, but also because you can find them in, 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 at one place. And I'm sure you'll put this in the show notes, but they're Absolutely. great. They're, they're, they're friends and really, really talented photographers that everyone does take a minute and look at their work and you'll, you'll be inspired. Well, thank you, Melissa. Always a pleasure to have a chance to talk with you, and congratulations again on the book. Thank you, and you're, I'm honored to be on this, this podcast with such a great, wonderful, long history of talented photographers, so I'm very honored and appreciate your time as well. Thanks to Melissa for joining us. Find out more about Melissa and her work by visiting melissaoshaughnessy.com. And if you want to purchase her book, Perfect Strangers, please consider using our Amazon affiliate link in our show notes or website to help support the show. And if you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. 
on our YouTube channel. I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or making a one-time or reoccurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to David Jordanson, Wu Ji Rang, Paul Nitschi, and Corrine Von Redding for their recent contributions. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.